are thrilled to have Gwyneth Borden, who I've known, I think, for the better part of a decade now, who is, um, amongst other things, the chair of the SFMTA. And I'll let you describe a little bit what the SFMTA is for people who don't know it. But we have a little bit of bonus content. Um, you are also the head of public policy for essentially the diamond not lobbying industry, but the Diamond Foundry, Foundry yes. yes. Um, so why don't you talk just briefly about what that is and um, sort of what you're doing in regards to synthetic diamonds. Yeah, so it's, I get to have two jobs, one, one that actually pays and one that doesn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Diamond Foundry is a startup, and I actually we have one of our investors in the room from Obvious Ventures, Andrew Beebe. We, are, we, we create single crystal diamond wafers for jewelry and for semiconductors. Um, when earlier there was a speaker talking about the green premium, Lab-grown diamonds present a new opportunity because there's no green premium. They're, 50, they're 30 to 50% less than mined diamonds without the ecological disaster and damage that you cause, without the humanitarian damage that you cause. Most people don't know that you can grow a diamond and it's exactly atomically the same as a diamond you would mine from the earth. A diamond is just carbon. It's not really that unique other than the fact that a long time ago, Thomas Rose disco discovered that diamonds could be a very lucrative industry. The other thing that's exciting about diamonds it's a luxury product that people spend a lot of money for, so we're getting engaged, so there's a huge impact. America consumes half of the world's diamonds, so we are the biggest diamonds market. You may not have known that Russia was the largest diamond producer. The diamonds have been banned, although they probably can still sneak in through India and China, but the point is, we don't think about in the purchases of a luxury good the difference that that makes on our planet, and also in, in sort of rewarding, say, bad actors. But the other exciting portion of what we do is that diamond is as a semiconductor. Diamond has the best thermal conductivity of any other product. It has five times more of the conductivity of copper, and it has huge potential for energy savings and power computing. It actually could replace the silicone chip in the future. We are looking on that innovation. I mean, you want to talk about greening data centers and helping power electronics perform better? Diamond is that solution. So we are working on that, and that's very exciting, uh, I think, for the future. And I think there's not enough conversation around how diamond can actually be a real climate solution. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how to segue from diamonds <laughs> to, to transportation, but we're going. That's another climate I solution. Did. I guess I just did, right? So, um, so talk to us um, a little bit. Explain what the SFMTA is for people who don't. I mean, so they've probably ridden BART. They've probably ridden Muni. They've probably, you know, um, and we're going to get into BART and Caltrain and all sort of the complex governance issues for those who live here in the Bay Area. But what is the SFMTA and, and just briefly about your role? The San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency oversees buses, parking, taxis, streets, and micromobility within the city and county of San Francisco. Before COVID, we had over 200 million trips a year and we're the ninth largest transportation uh, organization. So we oversee anything that happens on the streets except for TNCs, which we can talk about later. But the whole point of SFMTA a few years ago, it was decided that you needed to bring all of the different implements together to solve things like climate, to solve things like congestion and traffic. And so we are that umbrella agency that sees, oversees all of these different dynamics. And the reason that it matters is in 2004, San Francisco created its very first climate action plan. We are actually ahead of the goals that we set. We had set to be to our 1990 levels of emissions, and we were, we were already there. In fact, we're 40% below where we were in 1990 versus in emissions. When people talk about climate, though, I think the missing picture often is transportation, and specifically public transportation. Everyone's talking about EVs, but you know, EVs are exciting, but the future is more congestion on the road where lots of people now feel like they can drive because they have an EV. That's not a solution. Public transit, I don't know if most people realize, when you talk about greenhouse gases generally, whether you're talking about it at the city level or at the federal level, more than half of the emissions in a city or a country come from transportation. It is the largest sector. Everyone's obsessed with food and all these other areas, and those things are important and matters, but it's the transportation of those products and things that is very difficult. You can't transport without planes, which are not yet electric, or, or boats, or trucks, and so there's a lot more innovation needed in that space, and public transit is a key component in that. San Francisco, in San Francisco, 47% of the greenhouse gases, as I mentioned, come from transportation. We only represent 1%, public transit 1%. And public transit moves, as I mentioned, over 200 million trips a year. So think about all the trips you're taking out of the system when you invest in public transit. I think people have a cognitive dissonance about their role in, in making choices when it comes to public transit, and it's not just about 
buses. It's also about micro mobility, like scooters and bicycles. It's really about the last mile. They find that most people will take public transit if once they leave their house and they get to their so-called destination, how far it is from um, where they need to go. And so we are really looking at how do we create that network where the last mile is solved for. So that's the scooters, the bikes, and other forms of mobility. But you can't talk about climate without dealing with the transportation issue. And you really have to talk about public transportation because let's face it, for a lower income individual that needs to get to work, they cannot afford to buy an electric vehicle. We're probably a long ways away from that. You can buy a cheap car for seven or $800 and get it fixed. It doesn't have great emissions, right? We luckily in California, we do have like smog checks and, and requirements and CARB, our California Air Resources Board has requirements around um, fuel efficiency and mileage. but. But still, we have a long ways to go where the individual consumer would be able to afford electric vehicle. And it is not even the solution, really. The solution has to be public transit. We have to do mode shift. We have to get people to think differently about getting out of their cars. I mean, cars provide a convenience. People want to get point A, point B. They want free parking. That's another thing we find. And we're, we're creating solutions where we're making people choose other modes by kind of making them not drive, right? Think yeah. about how they get to places. And San Francisco has a sort of this unique advantage in the sense of, let's talk a little about hydropower, right? Now, if you, if you grew up like I had in the Bay Area and you go to San Francisco, you see the buses that are attached to the lines running electric and they'd always get stalled or get caught in a tree or something like that. Um, but, <laughs> not um, so much anymore, those were the old poles. <laughs> those are the old poles, but you know, we still see that. Um, but what actually is that? So Hetch Hetchy, talk a little about Hetch Hetchy yeah. Reservoir and what that means in terms of hydropower for San Francisco. And the follow on question of that is, you know, building reservoirs and things, can cities also think about hydropower in terms of building reservoir, but talk about how that Hetch Hetchy feeds and drives hydropower in San Francisco and the buses and things like that. You know, we were lucky that San Francisco over 100 years ago had the foresight to, you can argue about damming, but <laughs> dam in, build a dam in Sierra is called Hetch Hetchy, and that is the water system by which powers San Francisco. It is, we have uh, wholesale customers like Santa Clara County, and then we have direct customers in various counties, and the hydropower is actually what powers many of our um, city facilities, including our buses. So you see, if you go to San Francisco, you see these buses on these lines, these trolley buses. Those are electric buses powered by hydropower. And so it really has allowed us for a long time to be a very clean transit fleet. We also use uh, clean diesel buses, and we're, we're currently looking to transition to fully electric battery buses. But as you might know, we have very difficult steep hills and places to get around. Mm -hmm. So we are currently testing four different manufacturers' buses on our streets. But if you haven't invested in buses, please think about investing in buses, because that is an area that really needs some support, not just in the, in the public sector side, but you think about the commuter shuttle buses that I passed on my way from San Francisco down here that are not electric. So there's a real opportunity there, I think, in the, in the bus space. So we also have the cable cars. We also have the, the, the street cars, which are actually old cars that have been remodeled. Yeah. So um, the next time you're driving down 280 <laughs> and you look at Hetch Hetchy out there, it's like, you know. And then we have our regular buses, as I mentioned. And, and, and for us, one of the things that we've been looking at is how do you make transit faster and more reliable, right? That's the only way you're going to get people to choose transit is that it's faster and it's more reliable to get people where they need to go. And so we've really invested in a network of dedicated transit lanes that have really improved the speed and reliability. Because before, buses were sitting in the same traffic that people were sitting in cars. If you're sitting in a car and you see a bus go by faster, it's like, hey, maybe Maybe I'll take the bus next time. And we don't have the luxury of the subway network that you have in New York. Everybody would love to have a subway network, but it would take us 30 years to get there, and it would be a lot of hardship along the way. But buses provide a real opportunity because fixed route, route transit is very is challenged, right? It's challenged because of where it goes. Like when COVID happened and our transit ridership dropped 90%, overnight we had to relook at where trips were going, what people were doing. And as a consequence, we were able to recalibrate lines, add service in new areas. People were now going to hospitals, they were going to restaurants, they were actually going to grocery stores, they were going to places where they had worked. And our ridership then was all people who were essential workers, people who really had to get places, but you also had people who lived in neighborhoods who were just using it to get inner neighborhood trips, to, to go to the dry cleaner or to, to go to the doctor. So there's a real advantage of bus transportation and I think people really look down on it. But in terms of, of really being able to move more people successfully without generating emissions, there's nothing better. And, and I want to get to you know, sort of the uberfication of the world, no, <laughs> no, no disrespect to Lyft at all. Um, but in terms of what that means in the relationship the city and the SFMTA have with, say, Uber and Lyft. But before that, I, I want to talk about Caltrain. For those of you, you know, I'm, I live in New York City, so I love public transportation. So I take the Caltrain often when I'm here. Um, and there's a move to electrification for Caltrain. But talk a little bit about that. You know, the governance of Caltrain is kind of 
of odd. It's actually run by the San Mateo, um, sort right. of Sam Trans, if you will. It's um, been a source of heartache. Right now they're looking at governance structure because it's it's basically a subsidiary of Sam Trans, although board members are from San Francisco and Santa Clara. Right now they'll be looking at the governance structure. You know, there have been challenges around the electrification project, which is a long overdue project. The electrification will also help facilitate high speed rail. Um, you know, Caltrain has also, also suffered like every single transit agency did during COVID. You know, overnight, all of their, their all their riders disappeared, and Caltrain, just like BART and you know New York Transit, is really dependent upon fares. So when your ridership drops ninety percent, you are completely you know in in trouble. For sure. I mean, it's interesting because for most bus transit systems, you can't get fare box recovery ratio. If you're providing f cheap trips to get people across the city, you can't really charge people the true price of that. So. Like regular public transit, bus transit is very much reliant upon um, general funds of cities in order to function. Do you think we'd see full electrification of Caltrain by, say, the end of the decade? For sure, 100%. We, we are on path, it's just not as fast. As long as it's not the, <laughs> the California bullet train path. No, I mean, but it'll, it'll help with the bullet path. train and help us with bringing Caltrain downtown at some point in the future. So we talked about cars and, um, and, and obviously Uber and Lyft and people in San Francisco and all over the world love their Ubers and their Lyfts. Um, what's the relationship in terms of what relationship do you have at the MTA, the SFMTA and the city in terms of working with Uber and Lyft to ensure that either, you know, that those fleets, you talk a lot about fleets, whether it's buses, whether it's Uber or Lyft, to get those fleets of those cars within San Francisco or the Bay Area, um, hopefully that it's a purely electric fleet at some point. Yeah, I mean, that unfortunately has to resonate more with the state level. I mean, those companies really fought against having any sort of local regulation. And hey, nobody likes regulation. Now, obviously, a lot of innovation comes out of the fact that people are trying to avoid rules. I get it. And if you watch Super Pumped, I'm just telling you that first episode's completely false. We did not do, we did not behave the way that it's depicted there. <laughs> but what I will say is when you're trying to move transit, move you know, 700,000 people around a day, having cluttered streets is really problematic. You know, we made our, our taxis go towards the green, go green and, and we actually provided incentives for them to do that. Um, most of our taxi fleet is now a green taxi fleet. In terms of those companies, some people, some of them have goals, some of them don't, but because of the churn of drivers, it's not necessarily their priority to focus on only green vehicles, right? If you have a lot of churn and you're really trying to get people on the street. What's exciting now is that we are in conversations with Uber, specifically with adding our taxis to the app because they're really actually having a hard time. And that just happened in making, New York. Yeah, and, and we've been talking to them about it for a while and our taxi drivers are really, despite the fact that they've hated Uber for a very long time, they're really excited about the access to that greater pool of customers. And so they're talking about just making it like you would call a car and it could be a taxi that shows up, not that you specifically identify taxis. And so that's a really exciting new development because I think if we can help drive people back to taxis. I mean, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with, with Ubers and Lyfts, but what we found is that we had 1,800 total taxis in the city of San Francisco, which is part of the reasons why you couldn't get a taxi when you came to town. But during peak times, we had close to 20,000 Ubers and Lyfts on the street. I mean, the, the X-fold amount of congestion that that was generating is, is like, Unbelievable. So we have to solve that issue. Like it is, it is great that we have that convenience, but we do need those companies to, to really focus on how they can help green their fleet right. and, and encourage drivers. And even talking about some them. of the shuttle buses, a lot of shuttles run and, and take the employees down to Google that live in the city and, and that you can only mandate something if they stop at a actual San Francisco bus right. stop, right? So it's and also- it's the use of our stops. Privately, they have to choose to do that on their own if they don't already have a hybrid or electric bus that takes people down to, to Google. So we are pretty much at time, but I, I, what I wanted to, to get from you is whether it's at a federal level, state level, local level, um, what in in terms of either legislation around regulation or other types of initiatives within, you know, sort of government, are you know, excite you, or what's coming down the pike that people should be aware of, either from a regulatory or you know, sort of laws that might be making their way either through Washington or Sacramento. Well, I actually think the SEC climate disclosures are going to make a big difference, right? I mean, I think there is an issue. Like you look at, I mean, I look at different climate reports, and I can't really tell apples to oranges, and I think that consistency that will be encouraged as a result, I think people having to be transparent about that will be huge. I mean, I think California's done a great job. You know, we've, we've ex from a state level, the California Air Resources Board has really helped drive innovation here, what we've achieved climate goals much more quickly. So at the federal level is really where the challenge is, and so seeing 
opportunities at the federal level to really make companies make that shift, or at least look at making that shift and have shareholders and others hold them accountable, I think is the real difference. Yeah, that's great. Um, so the one other thing I'll say just as a Bay Area native, my mom was actually on the city council of San Jose from 80 to 92, and I remember she had these big binders from ABAG. <laughs> so the Association of Bay Area Governments, as well as the IGC, the Intergovernmental Council in the Bay Area, San Francisco is not just the Bay Area. I don't know how many cities now in the Bay Area, probably 7 million people in the metro. <laughs> yes. So you know, if you want to follow what's going on or even get involved, look at what's happening at ABAG, look at what's happening at the Intergovernmental Council, because you, know, you need the whole Bay Area and you need whole metros to get on board in terms of sort of you know, making sure that we're, we're taking care of these important issues. Mm -hmm.